All right, you guys. So um, we are now moving into unit four. Um, and unit four is the biggest unit of the year. And it's not even really close. Um, according to the College Board, unit four, which includes all of the institutions, which is Congress, um, then the executive, um, then the um, federal court system, and then the bureaucracy, um, those four parts of our course account for over 60% of the entire exam. So, you know, I mean, when I tell you that the entire exam, which will determine thousands of dollars for college credit for you, 60% um, is based on the next four chapters. Um, this is the time of year to really kind of zero in. And I like that we do it at this point in the year because by the time we start talking about Congress and the executive and you know the federal courts, at this point, you, you kind of have a a pretty good foundational working of how the government works. And so now in these units, we get to kind of go a little bit deeper um, and really kind of nerd out on um, exactly how bills become a law, how Congress is set up, the checks and balances, you know, all the things that allow you as an educated person to say, yeah, that's not right, um, are going to come out in these um, chapters. So without further ado, let's begin with the Congress unit. Okay, so first question here that we're going to look at, and I need to update this because guy on the top right was um, former Senator Cory Gardner, who just lost um, to um, Democrat John Hickenlooper um, in, back in November. Um, but who are members of Congress in general? Um, when we talk about Congress, right, this is a distinction that's oftentimes lost on the less educated, right, because Congress is a bicameral legislature. It's made up of two halves, right? You can talk about Congress, but then you must be more specific. Are you talking about the Senate or the House or both? If we are talking about both, then when we say who are members of Congress, the answer is, well, it's 535 members total with 100 in the Senate for elected for how long? Six years and 435 in the House elected for how long? Two years. Right, and so these 535 members um, represent the legislative branch of our government. They make laws, um, they do oversight, um, they are the heart, if you want to say, the heart of American democracy. Um, plain and simply, also members of Congress must reside in the state and the district that they represent. So. Um, Senator Michael Bennett, um, prior to becoming senator from Colorado, was um, he was the superintendent of Denver Public Schools, and then he was the mayor of Denver, and then um, you know he went from there. Um, and now John Hickenlooper, similar thing, right? He was mayor of Denver, then um, then he was governor of Colorado, and now he's senator. Um, the guy in the bottom right, uh, bottom middle, bottom right, is our representative Doug Lamborn. Uh, he covers Colorado Springs and represents the House of Representatives. And so when we talk about the House, the basic requirements, the House is the easiest um, branch of Congress and easiest um, really within the entire federal government system um, to get a spot, right? The, the rim or the limitations or the requirements are less. The House, you only need to be 25 years old. So that's pretty young, right? But the Constitution makes clear. In the Constitution, it says House of Representatives must be 25, 25 years old, um, and they must be a citizen for at least the last seven years. Now, this is an interesting um, fact, because obviously, if you look at citizen for at least the last seven years, implied in that would be that you could be born in a different country. You could have lived most of your life in a different country, but maybe you immigrated to the United States and became a citizen. And then seven years later, you could run for Congress, right? And the House of Representatives, the Senate. Um, and and I, I should say that the House set up by the founders um, was built to sort of be the voice of the people. That's why there's 435 of them. That's why each House member represents a much smaller district, a much specific, much more specific geographic area, even with gerrymandering, right? And so the House is very, like, people-oriented, and it's very populous, and it's, as uh, as a result, right, also, plain and simply, we're kind of a lot more crazy um, people um, exists. So now we see Marjorie Taylor Greene down in Georgia and her whack job QAnon nonsense. 
um, as a House member. We had Michelle Bachman, famously in Minnesota, who was wacky. We had Steve King, the proclaimed racist and KKK member representing a district in Iowa, right? Um, the House was much more the voice of the people. Um, the Senate was set up by the founders to sort of be a check on that voice of the people. They were set up by the founders um, to be sort of the representative body for the elites, um, which is why there's, a, there's less of them. They represent entire states and the requirements are older. They have to be 30 instead of 25, and they need to be a citizen for at least nine years. So um, slightly higher threshold for each. Um, now, when you look at who are the members of Congress, we're going to look at all the perks that they have and powers that they have and what they're able to do and how they work and all that sort of thing. And I think the question then is like, well, I can see all the good things about it. And you know, you're a powerful person. If you're a senator, you're one of the most top 150 most powerful people in the country. Um, I can see all the good things. What are the drawbacks? Like, why wouldn't everyone want to become a sitting member of Congress? And, you know, the drawbacks is um, it is very, very routine and expected for members of Congress to work 14 hour days, right? They're working six days a week, 14 hour days, um, getting, you know, business dinners in the evening and going back to the office and, you know, working on legislation and working in, in committees and with fellow members for a long time each day. They're constantly traveling because they are expected to be back in their districts pretty regularly. So, you know, the amount of flights that they, they log on, you know, commercial um airliners where they're flying coach just like the rest of us because they're using taxpayer dollars they can't sit first class they're flying back and forth between their districts in washington dc um, they are constantly fundraising we looked at that with campaign finance and the expectations around how much money it takes to run for office basically means that they are constantly fundraising and you know i think there's this as we've gotten more polarized and more split you're seeing a lot of members of Congress retire because of the partisan frustration and the feeling that they're not accomplishing anything, that they yell a lot and, you know, take principled stands, but they're not actually doing the will of the people. And that's that's kind of the frustration that a lot of people are Congress are dealing with in, in the hyper polarized times of today. Um, but the benefits are right that you have a seat at the table. And for a lot of you, as you grow up, this is going to be something that you care about that. You know, I if I care about this organization or if I care about this company or if I care about this school, that I want um, a seat at the table. I want to I want to have um, a voice. I want to you know have decision making power. I want to be able to decide things, um, and they have that. And I think that power is pretty intoxicating for a lot of people. Uh, they also have very generous health and retirement benefits. Um, that as long as you serve, you have a pension, a congressional pension for the rest of your life. Um, and you're on, you know, congressional health care. So um, some definite benefits, clear drawbacks. Um, let's move on. Um, this is for today's do now. Um, and I, if you haven't done the do now, and I would kind of advise you, I think I advise you the directions not to, um, let's take a look at it, right? This is a portrait of the 113th Congress. This is, you know, I think we're in the 116th Congress now, so we're 118th Congress, so it's old now, but it's probably still fairly accurate. Um, let's see who these members are, right? So let's take a look at the column for the House, right? When we look at um, the House, we see in the 113th, it was 201 Democrats, 234 Republicans. Um, we see an enormous gender disparity, especially as a percentage of the overall population. Women account for um, over 50, slightly over 50% of the human race, and yet they represent a fraction of that um, in Congress. And we're gonna look at reasons why and, and the challenges there, but um, suffice it to say they are in extremely underrepresented. And then when you look at race and ethnicity, the overwhelming majority of them are still very white, right? We've, especially within the Democratic side, gotten um, more diverse, um, but still a, a, an overwhelmingly white population um, and then you look at religion and you can sort of see, right, that they, uh, Christians um, account for 84% with Protestants leading the way. Um, and then prior occupations, right, you see, no, not surprisingly, that lawyers and previous government workers 
dominate. But interestingly enough, you see, um, you know, former doctors, you see business professionals, you see professors or teachers. Um, it's interesting, right? And so you're going to use this chart to do the do now to kind of create that snapshot of who is Congress gener generally, right? So moving on, um, the slide we're going to look at now is um, how well can such a non-reflective body represent the average American, right? Like we already saw that, that Congress is overwhelmingly white and male and made up of government uh, government former government or law workers um, they are rich they're older than the average american um how can they represent the average americans and you know the short answer is is it's fair to question whether they can right and because we know from psychology or sociology that a person's personal backgrounds definitely influences their worldview and their worldview influences their priorities and and what they vote on um and so if you were to take the, the top left picture, this is the Congressional Black Caucus. This is basically it's the the members of Congress who obviously identify as African-American. This is um, kind of the, the group of them. They, they, they meet together on the Congressional Black Caucus. And um, down in the bottom left, you see the Congressional Latino Caucus. But if you were to take, um, you know, an African-American female businesswoman um, and say, well, let's check and see how you voted. Um, you're going to see that on average that that woman would vote for um, issues that would that would serve the you know African American female business community right and and that's not surprising that's humans being humans and so as a result of this um, and the fact that you know members of Congress don't claim to be um, mirror images of their constituents, uh, most members of Congress do not claim something called descriptive representation. Descriptive representation means their description of them on paper um, does not match their constituents. Um, descriptive representation would be like you represent a working class, um, you know, majority person of color community and you yourself came from working class backgrounds and identify as a person of color. That would be descriptive representation. Most members of Congress don't do that. Um, they, they do um, live amongst their constituents or, I mean, I guess, I'm sorry, let me backtrack. People that claim descriptive representation mirror the constituents' characteristics. They oftentimes live amongst the constituents and therefore represent their beliefs. But more commonly um, is something called substantive representation, right? Where members of Congress don't um, look like or they would not be described the same as their constituents, but um, they substantially or substantively um, represent their constituents by um, basically um, representing the interests of the groups or the people that they represent. So if you were, you know, let's say you yourself grew up white and rich, but represent the working class um, majority person of color neighborhood, then, you know, if you're claiming substantive representation, then you are looking out for their interest and representing the interests of the working class um, person of color, um, which defines your district. Um, Senator Edward, Edward Kennedy was famous for this. Edward Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, was spent his entire 45-year career in, um, in government, in, in the Senate, um, championing issues of the poor, right? Um, healthcare and the poor, even though he was a Kennedy and from a family that was many, many millionaires. So I told you we were going to look at this question, why aren't there more women in Congress? And um, we're going to um, kind of go through it here um, and probably pick up um, in Tuesday's lecture. Why aren't there more women in Congress? Well, um, we need to start by saying that women actually do um, win at roughly the same rates as men when they run. Um, so when a woman runs for Congress, they, they don't disproportionately lose. They, they're not far less successful in the running process. Um, but if they account for less than 20% of Congress and then win at normal rates, then the conclusion you can draw is that less run, right? But 
and less run for a lot of reasons, right? We're going to look at them, some some understandable and some, you know, an example of the patriarchy is still in action. They're definitely less often to be their party's nominees. And women with children um, are shown, unsurprisingly, to run less often than men with children. Um, 